All right, so we are making our way through Unit 6 of Jews, Israel, and Jesus. And Unit 6 is called Covenant. God is a covenant-keeping God. A covenant is a binding agreement between parties. And when there is a covenant, it is wise to understand the terms of that covenant, especially a blood covenant where one or both parties might have to pay at the expense of their own blood, meaning their life, if they violate the terms of that covenant. Well, we've made our way to point D, and point D is Sinai, the law, the Sinai covenant, what we would call the old covenant. If you are a new covenant believer, you would be calling this the old covenant. This covenant was cut with Israel at Mount Sinai. It is also referred to as the law of Moses, and this covenant is a two-sided covenant that fades away, so there is a term limit on on this. It is not everlasting, which would be eternal, and it is not one-sided where God is the only one obligated to keep the terms that he has guaranteed. This is a two-sided covenant, which means if you do this, then I will do that. If you do this, then I will do that. So there are two sides to this, and this covenant fades away. It is valid until the order of this world passes away. You may not have heard that before, but I'll show you in the scriptures that that is true and how the New Testament testifies of that as well. But first, let's understand that the law was never God's original design. The law was never God's desire. God's desire was always for his people to simply obey his voice. Why? Well, because he's God and he's worthy of obedience just to his voice. Obedience to his voice was always what God desired, and Abraham obeyed God's voice. Remember Genesis 22, the promise when the angel of the Lord says, now surely I will fulfill everything that I have promised you because I know that you fear God because you have obeyed my voice. Abraham obeyed God's voice. Isaac received the benefit of Abraham's obedience. Jacob, the covenant was passed to him. Now by Sinai, this is 400 years later, this is the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they have been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years, and God delivers them. Does he deliver them by the law? No. He delivers them by the blood of the lamb, and he delivers them by their faith and obedience. The law had not been given yet. It was an act of faithful obedience. All right, so let's understand Israel, the nation of Israel, started out obeying God's voice. We're going to read from Exodus chapter 12, starting with verse 3. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head and its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. 
The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And we'll jump to verse 28. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. So you see, the people were given a command. God was saying that he was raining down judgment on all Egypt. And everyone in Egypt, including the Israelites, they were not perfect either. They were in their own sins. And we know from later parts of the Bible that they were also worshiping false gods while they were in Egypt and even while they were in the wilderness. So Israel also deserved the judgment of God. They deserved for the destroyer to come into their households and take their firstborn as well. But God gave the command. Take a lamb, slaughter the lamb, paint the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your house. And the lintel is the beam that goes across the top of the door. So on each of the doorposts on the side and then the beam that goes across the top. Paint the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your house. Eat the slaughtered lamb as your Passover meal with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. This was the command of the Lord. And for this, the Lord said, I will pass over you and you will not be destroyed when the destroyer is sent through Egypt to take all of the firstborn. And at this, the people of Israel obeyed. Now, maybe because they'd been in slavery for 430 years, they were so desperate they were willing to do anything. Sometimes that's when the most obedience comes in people's lives is when they're willing to try anything crazy. If God has told me to do this, yep, I'm going to do it because I want out of this slavery so bad. But that's a different conversation for a different day. Well, after God led the people of Israel out of Egyptian slavery and through the parted waters of the Red Sea, he tested their obedience again. He wanted to see if they would obey his voice, simply obey his voice without laws, without a written code, if they would just obey his voice. So he was going to test them. This is Exodus 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So God was going to give bread from heaven. We know now that that is manna. They didn't have a name for it yet at this point because it hadn't come yet. But God is saying, I'm going to bring bread from heaven. And then he gives the command to them in this same passage that for six days you go out and gather this bread from heaven. But on the seventh day, rest. Do not gather any. And don't worry, I'll give you a double portion on the sixth day so that on the seventh day you'll have plenty and it will last you through until the beginning of the next week. But at this, the people did not obey. They gathered six days and then on the seventh day they went right out to look to see if the manna was there. But it was not there because God had told them it wasn't going to be there because God had told them he was only going to give it for six days and not to go out on the seventh day. So they did not obey his voice. The voice of God wasn't enough for them as it had been for Abraham, who proved faithful and obedient to God's voice. Well, as another note, sacrifices of atonement were never God's desire. The law, the law of Moses, requires sacrifices for atonement, atonement for sins that have been committed. But even that was never God's desire. Obedience to his voice has always been what God has wanted. So let's look at the scripture that talks about that. We're going all the way to the book of Jeremiah when Jeremiah is speaking on behalf of the Lord and the Lord is saying, look, I never wanted sacrifices. I wanted obedience. This is Jeremiah 7, starting with verse 22. For in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. So that right there is referring to the passage we just read from Exodus 16. God didn't say, offer me a sacrifice and I'll rain down bread for you. No, he said, I'm going to rain down bread for you. Now obey my voice and only gather it on six days. What he wanted was obedience to his voice. He didn't immediately go into talking about sacrifices with them. That comes much later, and we're going to talk about that, but that wasn't God's initial intent or design. But we're still in Jeremiah 7. We're up to verse 23. But this command I gave them. 
Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the way that I command you, that it may be well with you. See, obedience to God's voice is always what he has wanted. But because the people failed to obey God's voice, God made a covenant with the people at Mount Sinai, and he disclosed his laws and his statutes and his commandments and his regulations and all of his requirements of what it would take to be in covenant with God, to be the covenant people of God, to maintain right standing with God. And just as a side note, Predisclosed written codes of law were unheard of in any ancient civilization in that day. This is such a wonderful grace and mercy of God because in societies in that day, typically the king or the chief or the ruler of a people or a nation or an empire, they had all authority and they usually considered themselves to be gods or semi gods in the earth. Well, they also, because of their position, of authority. They had the right to create legislation however they saw fit, according to whatever their view or sense of justice was in any particular case, whether they had partiality for one person or one type of person or another, if they had preferences, or if they were just in a bad mood that day. They could create legislation based on their own opinions. It was not disclosed in advance. It was all made up as they went along. And if they contradicted themselves, then they would just issue a new decree and find some clever way of saying, no, I'm not an imperfect ruler. It's just that this is a different situation. So they're they're just creating the code of law as they go. Well, God is pre-disclosing all of the terms of the covenant. This is a covenant. He's cutting covenant with his people, and he's saying, this is what's required. These are the requirements. If you do this, then you will receive the blessing. If you don't do this, then you will be under the curse. That's how covenants go. If you keep the terms, we're good. If you don't keep the terms, then there's going to be a problem. But the point is that God, because the people were unable to simply obey his voice, he goes in to give them the written code of his covenant. So before God gives the people his requirements and his regulations, his laws, his decrees, his statutes, ordinances, all of these things, he tells the people what the blessing will be if they are obedient. This is before he's given them any regulations. We're in Exodus 19. We're going to start with verse 5. Now, therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So God was speaking to Moses about that. We're at verse 7. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. So even though so far the people have not been able to obey God's voice, they hear, oh, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you'll be my treasured possession. And they say, yes, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do it. We will do it. We will obey. Unanimously, all of them answered together and said, we will do it. This is the first time that they make an absolute and total commitment to obey the commands of God. God, given by his voice, that he's speaking by his voice, the commands that he's about to give them. And you see that this is the introduction to the if then two-sided covenant. If you, then I. If you, then I. So that's this is a different kind of covenant. And it was also God's desire for all Israel to be consecrated to him and all Israel to ascend the mountain and enter into his presence. Not just Moses as the representative, but all of the people. He wanted all the people to be in his presence. He wanted all the people to hear his voice and obey 
obey his voice. This is Exodus 19, verses 10 to 13. The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain, or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. Now, that's where most people stop. And that's why it's commonly thought that only Moses ascended to the mountain and that God never made a way for all the people to come up. But let's finish the rest of the verse. What it says is, when the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So yes, you cannot come until the appointed time, but when the trumpet sounds a long blast, the people of Israel, all of them, were supposed to ascend the mountain and be in the presence of God. That is always what God wanted for his people, to draw near to him, to be in his presence, to hear his voice and be his special people. Well, as God came down upon Mount Sinai, we're going to go into Exodus 19, starting with verse 18, about what this appearance of the Lord looked like at Mount Sinai. The people had consecrated themselves for three days, and now they were at the base, not crossing the boundaries and the limits that were set until the trumpet sounds. They weren't going to touch the mountain or draw near, but now they were at the base of the mountain waiting for the appearance of the Lord. And here he is, Exodus 19. Starting with verse 18. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. And Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. So imagine you are an Israelite standing there, and the appearance of the Lord of fire and smoke and thunder, and the mountain is quaking and trembling greatly. This is the God of all creation coming down out of the heavens to the top of Mount Sinai to talk to you. And then we're going to go into Exodus 20, which is immediately following this. And God speaks the Ten Commandments to all Israel. Everyone hears the voice of God coming out from the fire that is on top of Mount Sinai. This is Exodus 20, starting with verse 1. We're just going to read through the Ten Commandments because that's the summary of the requirements of God, and all Israel heard them with their own ears. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord would not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates." For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. So that's the Ten Commandments, the ten words that God spoke to all of Israel from the top of Mount Sinai. And just to give you a confirmation that God spoke to all of them this, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 12 to 13, that states this plainly. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. So there it is. From the book of Deuteronomy, God spoke the whole of the Ten Commandments to all Israel who was standing at the base of the mountain. And the Ten Commandments summarizes how God wants people to relate to him and how God wants people to relate to one another as his holy people. Well, at Mount Sinai, the people were too terrified of God. This appearance of God in fire and smoke and the rumbling and the supernatural trumpet sound, they were too afraid to ascend the mountain the way the Lord wanted them to. So we're going to pick up. We just finished at Exodus 20, verse 17. This is now Exodus 20, verse 18. So we're going right through immediately after the Ten Commandments are given. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So God coming down in fire and smoke and thunder and an earthquake trembling the mountain, that was to instill the fear of the Lord in his people, so that they would obey him, so that they would not sin, so that he could bless them. He wasn't trying to be mean and evil and scary. He wanted them to have the right and proper respect for him so that they would obey him so that his blessing could be upon them. However, they were too afraid. And so they said, Moses, you go be our representative. You speak to God. You come back. Tell us what he said. We'll do whatever you say. We'll believe you. But it is too scary to go up into that smoke and fire, man. We're not going. You go but if we go, we're going to die. So you go on our behalf. You come down. Tell us what he said. So Moses goes up on the mountain and he receives from the Lord more laws and codes about slaves, restitution, social justice, things that God wanted his people to obey as his covenant people. And Moses came back down and told the people all that the Lord required. And they agreed again, we will do it. So let's look at this. This is now Exodus 24, starting with verse 3. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. He took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said again, this is now the third time. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. So God had said, These are the terms and conditions. Obey these, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will be blessed above all nations. You will be my treasured possession, etc. The blessings. The the people said, yay, we will do everything God says, even though we haven't so far. We will. We promise. Of course we will. So they're guaranteeing, yes, we are entering into this covenant. Well, this is a covenant ceremony. The blood being spattered on the altar was representative of the blood being spattered on the Lord. And then the blood being spattered on the people was that the people were entering into a blood covenant with the Lord. So remember, in the first class, we talked about how blood 
blood covenants, sometimes both parties would cut the palm of their hand and then mingle blood together so that they were sharing blood, the blood of the covenant. And in a covenant ceremony, they would read all of the terms that both parties were agreeing to. So that's exactly what's happening here. Moses wrote down everything that the Lord had said in the laws that he had given in the chapters between Exodus 20 and Exodus 24. And then he said, this is the book of the covenant. He read it before all the people. They said, yes, we are entering into this covenant with God. And the blood is the sealing and the sign of that covenant. So the people were covered in blood. The altar was covered in blood. And this is how the covenant cutting ceremony went. Animals were sacrificed representing the death of the party who did not keep their end of the agreement. Well, the people, the majority of the people, stayed at the base of Mount Sinai. But Moses, Aaron and his sons, and the elders of Israel, these are the leaders, these are the God-appointed authorities, they ascended the mountain and they had a covenant meal with God. Remember, we talked about how having a meal together, sometimes for several days, that is how covenants were established and sealed and commemorated. You would have a covenant meal together, often oftentimes eating the sacrifices that were made for the covenant itself and for creating the blood of the covenant. So let's look at how the elders of Israel shared a covenant meal with the Lord in this covenant cutting ceremony. This is Exodus 24, starting with verse 9, immediately following the verses we just read. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up. So you see, they go up to the presence where God was. And they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay a hand on the chief men of the people of Israel, meaning they had entered into his presence, and technically they probably should have died because he is a holy God. But they entered into his presence and they did not die. No, they saw the God of Israel. The scripture continues, they beheld God and ate and drank. So the elders of Israel went into God's presence and they ate and shared a covenant meal. So after this, God proceeded to give Moses the design for the Ark of the Covenant, the design for the tabernacle and its furnishings, the requirements and regulations for the consecration of the priests and what the priests were supposed to wear, and also for the altar of sacrificial offerings and the incense offering that would go inside the tabernacle before the veil into the most holy place. So these were all more regulations that God gave for how he would be able to be in covenant with his people and dwell among them, that his presence could be with his people. So before this tabernacle was erected, Moses would go outside the camp to a place called the Tent of Meeting. And there, God would come to the tent and meet with Moses and speak with him face to face as a man speaks with his friend. But by the end of the book of Exodus, the the tabernacle is erected according to God's design that he gave to Moses, but the problem is that Moses could not enter into the tabernacle after it was set up. So at the end of the book of Exodus, Moses is standing outside of the tabernacle. Well, then you go into the book of Leviticus, and the entire book of Leviticus gives more detailed regulations about the sacrifices, the offerings, the priests, the feasts of the Lord, all of the requirements that God requires for washing away and atoning for sin. And this is more blood of the covenant. Let's look at Exodus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So even as God entered into this covenant with his people, he knew that his people were not going to be able to be perfectly obedient obedient. And if they are missing the mark, well, sin means to miss the mark. If you don't get it perfectly, then you have missed the mark. That is sin. You have not done the will of God perfectly. So God made provision within this covenant of, okay, if you violate one of the terms of the covenant, you won't just die immediately because he's not that kind of God. No, but someone has to die for the sin that has been committed. Someone has to die when we are in blood covenant together and you have violated one of the terms of that covenant.
covenant. So God made provision for sacrifices. Sacrifices could be offered and their blood would be shed as the blood of the covenant to keep that covenant relationship strong and intact, which would be called righteousness, a right relationship. For us to maintain right relationship, if you have violated terms of the blood covenant, then you have to offer blood of some kind. If it's not your own, then a substitution needs to be offered in your place. So that's what the book of Leviticus is mainly about, how to maintain that right relationship with God so that this blood covenant is preserved and God can continue to bless his people. And then after the book of Leviticus comes the book of Numbers. After these sacrifices are given and the rules and the regulations for these sacrifices are given, then at the very beginning of the book of Numbers, where do we see Moses? He's inside the tabernacle. Now he is able to enter into the presence of God again and have conversations with him again because acceptable sacrifices have been made the way that he requires according to this blood covenant. Well, another sign of the covenant is the Sabbath. Now, remember, the first command that God gave Israel when they came out of slavery in Egypt was the Sabbath. That is how he tested whether they would obey his voice or not. It was the first command that he had given even before the law was given. Then within the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath is the fourth commandment. So God emphasizes, you're going to keep the Sabbath because I am the God who created heaven and earth. I created it in six days and on the seventh day I rested. You have been brought out of slavery. You now on the seventh day, you rest because I have given you rest as a gift and you are the people of the God who worked for six days and then rested. So the last commandment given in all of these series of commandments in the book of Exodus before the tabernacle is erected, the last of the commands given to Moses in Exodus is the Sabbath. So it's the first command, it's in the middle, and it's the last command. So hear this language of what God says about the Sabbath. This is Exodus 31, starting with verse 13. You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. So there it is. Just like circumcision was the sign of God's covenant with Abraham, the Sabbath is the sign of the covenant between God and the people of Israel. God, he said, I created the earth and the heavens in six days and then rested on the seventh day and blessed it and made it holy. I sanctified the seventh day. Now he's saying, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I am the Lord who makes you holy. This is the sign that you You are my people. You are the holy people of the holy God, the only one who created heaven and earth. We're at verse 14. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days work shall be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. So I hope you're starting to see that when God gives reference to violations of the Sabbath later and especially throughout the prophets, it seems like, well, God, why are you so upset that they're working on the Sabbath? Well, this is the sign. This is the same as if you were not circumcised into the covenant of Abraham. This is the sign that God has given of the covenant between God and his people. If you violate the Sabbath, God requires that you be cut off from the people, just like if you were not circumcised, you must be cut off from the people. God takes the Sabbath very seriously because it is the sign of the covenant. We're at verse 16. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the 
the Sabbath is the sign that these are the people of the Most High God, maker of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But take note, this covenant is different than the covenant that God had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, we emphasized one-sided, everlasting. This one is two-sided, and it fades away. So this is different than the covenant that God had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. However, it confirms them as the people who are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and confirms God's promise to be God to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So let's look at some scriptures that pertain to that. Deuteronomy 5, starting with verse 2. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. That's another word for Sinai. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, while I stood between the Lord and you at that time, to declare to you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up into the mountain. So Moses is saying, this is not the same covenant that God made with our fathers. That means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not under the law. They were under obedience to God's voice. And because Abraham obeyed God's voice, God unconditionally promised that he would bring his word to pass. But this is an entirely different kind of covenant that God is now making with the Israelites. And in Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses proceeds to give a recap of the Ten Commandments because Moses gives the book of Deuteronomy when the people are about to enter into the promised land. So he's reminding them, this is the way of God. Keep the way of God so that you can be blessed in the promised land and God can prosper you. Well, toward the end of the book of Deuteronomy, he says again, this is the sworn covenant and confirms that this means that you are the people of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So let's look. This is Deuteronomy 29, starting with verse 10. You are standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders, and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourner who is in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today. So this is before they're entering into the promised land, and Moses is reiterating the covenant of God. He has re- restated the requirements of God. He's saying, obey the Lord your God so that it may go well with you. You are standing here today, the sons of your fathers, and now this is the covenant that God is entering into with you. We're at verse 13, that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God as he promised you, and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. It is not with you alone that I am making this sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here with us today before the Lord our God and whoever is not here with us today. So that's the people of Israel who are included in the covenant, this covenant, the Sinai covenant, the law of Moses that God has between himself and his people to be their God and that they will be his people. And the scripture is clear that God has not dealt with any other nation, never before and never since. There is no other nation in all the earth except for Israel, that God has given his laws, his statutes, his rules and regulations to. Only the people of Israel out of all the nations of the earth, he has not dealt with any other nation in this way. Let's look at Psalm 147, verse 19 to 20. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes, and his rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. So there it is. This is the Sinai covenant that God has entered into with his people. It's two-sided. If you obey, then you will be blessed. And in the next class, we're going to get into the blessings and the curses for obedience and what that means for God's people. (music) 